We are in the midst of a series of messages entitled, A Journey Through Lent. The purpose of Lent is for Christians to get prepared for the joy the Lord has planned for their lives. You know, as Jesus prepared for his ministry that ultimately led to the cross, he went into a wilderness for 40 days where he spent time in prayer and devotion to God. So as followers of Jesus, we set aside 40 days prior to Easter to intentionally exercise our spiritual disciplines of prayer, of study, of worship, of fasting, and to see God's will for our lives. Hopefully, the little devotional book that we sent to you by mail is also helping you to keep centered in Christ at this season. Now, during the Sundays of Lent, Jared and I are focusing on some of the Psalms, which really was that prayer book that Jesus had memorized as a child. As Jesus was in that wilderness for his 40 days of preparation, he certainly found strength in these prayers that he heard while growing up. These Psalms reflect the struggle of our spiritual journey, and they address the wilderness experiences that we all encounter and address the reality of living in the midst of a deeply broken world. Today, we're going to reflect on Psalm 42. This is written by a leader of a group of songwriters called the Korahites, who were singers in the temple in Jerusalem. Yet this leader had been displaced from his homeland. He was feeling down in the dumps. He was spiritually empty. In the midst of his pain, he composed this song that Angela will read for us now. Psalm 42. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng and led them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. This is the word of God for the people of God. All praise be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of each of our hearts, I pray they're going to be found loving and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock. You are our Redeemer. Amen. Uh, You know, last summer, in the middle of the pandemic, Amy and I would often take very long hikes in some of the area's metro parks up in Summit County. And after one particular hike on a hot day, I had already emptied my water bottle and I was still really thirsty. As we came back to the car, I spotted a vending machine, and I was going to grab a bottle of water. Now, as my family would note, I am notoriously frugal, and I would much rather get water out of a tap than to pay a dollar and 50 cents for a bottle out of a machine. But I was really thirsty. The water fountains had all been closed by the pandemic, and so I had to pull out my wallet to discover I was down to my last dollar. Well, fortunately, in the one pocket of my van that was parked nearby, I throw in some spare change, which included a couple quarters and a few dimes that I put into my pocket as I approached the machine. 
It was then that I saw that a bottle of water was not the dollar and 50 cents that I was accustomed to seeing, but at this machine, it was two bucks. It left me short by about 25 cents. I also realized that the machine would only take bills and quarters, and it didn't take dimes. Well, I debated going into a nearby store and pulling out my debit card to get a bottle of water when I realized I didn't have a mask, which they required for entrance into their store. And since I couldn't go into the store, I asked this woman who was walking into the establishment, hey, do you have two quarters that I could give you some of my dimes and nickels for instead? She must have looked at how much I was sweating and perhaps took a measure of pity on me. So she fished into her purse and and she pulled out a couple quarters and she just said, here, just take them. You can keep the change. I think between the pandemic and my perspiration, she probably didn't want anything to do, get anything from me. All I knew was now that I, how glad I was that I now had the necessary fund to buy that $2 bottle of water. I inserted the coins kind of one by one plus the dollar bill. I pushed the button, nothing. I pulled the coin return. Nothing. Now, in addition to my perspiration, I was getting a little hot with a dumb vending machine which charged two bucks for a bottle of water, didn't take dimes, and now was jam. (laughs) My thirst was making me cranky, irritable, agitated. (laughs) Now, friends, I was in no danger of dehydrating. But I think when you're thirsty... You're going to go to great lengths to be satisfied. I think this is not only the case when our bodies need water, but also in the case when our souls are starved for attention by God. There's a deep awareness in our scripture that we will encounter times when our spirits can run dry. Everyone who walks with God eventually arrives at the outer edge of a spiritual desert. What puts us into these kind of places? Well, I think a whole host of things, such as disappointment, discontentment, death, just to name a few. Maybe your spirits are starving after going into a nursing home, watching a parent waste away with Alzheimer's. Maybe it started at the fertility clinic after another disappointment of trying to get pregnant. Maybe it started when the boss stops to let you know that your services are no longer required. Anyone, or maybe all these circumstances, can send us packing into the wilderness where God will test your faith. Times like this, when you feel like you're walking through a spiritual desert, All the prayers seem to be like just dust in the wind. The Psalms frequently show that this spiritual depression is part of the course for our human experience. Yet throughout the Psalms, we also discover this counterintuitive practice of calling out to God for help rather than trying to stuff our feelings or to escape from our feelings or to drown them out in a bottle of sorrow. In today's Psalm 42, which Angela read, we discover a desperate cry of a depressed soul. The songwriter literally can't stop crying. The promising path of past success has come to a screeching halt, a dead end, no way out. This passage starts with that memorable line, as a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for God. In the title of the psalm, we learn that it was composed by the leader of the Korahites. Within the psalms, there are 11 of the 150 psalms that were put together by this group of people who traced their ancestry to one of the cousins of Moses who had ended up rebelling against Moses and Aaron in the desert and face the judgment of death due to that insurrection of his cousins. Yet we also know from the Bible that although Korah died as a result of his rebellion, that his family ultimately found redemption, serving as worship leaders in the temple within Jerusalem. 
in Psalm 42 and 43, well, they're really linked together, really. We hear the honest cry of help by God's servant, who was a cast-down soul. What we always have to remember is even strong believers in the Lord can grow despondent, we can grow depressed, and we can struggle with a cast-down soul. For instance, in Elijah, after Elijah's great victory over the prophets of Baal, he then went through a season when he asked God to, quote, take my life. In our study not long ago about Jonah, we saw how a petulant and moody God's prophet could become. Moses, he had his moments when he grew so tired of those stiff-necked people. He just wanted to call it quits. Paul had his thorn in the flesh. Why, even Mother Teresa had her own dark nights of the soul. For the leader of the Korahites, there's no mention of anything that caused this spiritual dehydration. He just hasn't felt that presence. He hasn't felt the power of God for some season of his life. Just as animals need water, human beings, we need God. Otherwise, we feel disconnected. We feel dry as a bone. So, what might be the cause of a cast-down soul on the part of this leader of the Korahites? Well, in verse 3, we read that tears have been his food day and night. Maybe there's some sleeplessness. Maybe there's some depression that the writer is facing. As you read Psalm 43, it becomes quickly apparent that this is written by a desperate and depressed soul who's feeling really empty, feeling very alone. Not only is there a depression of the spirit, but in verse 6, it seems that the psalmist has also been displaced from his community. He used to be a singer at the temple in Jerusalem. Now he seems to be living away in a land beyond the Jordan and of Hermon. When we have to relocate for any number of reasons, you can get so quickly into a funk. At one time, you went to worship with your friends in a certain place where you felt connected, where you could grow, no longer uh, be growing apart. I know for instance, last Easter, how much it was dreary. Because of the pandemic, we didn't have our palm branches. We didn't have our Easter flowers. We didn't have any of our beautiful choral music. I know I could easily slip into that kind of funk because I was feeling displaced from this worshiping community. And this was just for a couple of months. You know, for the writer of Psalm 43, he hasn't been able to worship in Jerusalem for years. Yet maybe. Maybe something more is going on here than just depression or displacement. Could it be that the psalmist is struggling with what we call a restless heart? That he has come to that point in his life when he senses that there has to be something more to life than just sucking in oxygen and getting as much pleasure as he can get in the span of his years and, he, and that he has been given. Maybe his soul is thirsty because he realizes the words of a much more recent song by you too, that he still hasn't found what he's looking for. In verse 9, the psalmist writes, quote, Why must I walk about mournfully? Certainly he is hungering for something so much more than what he has been experiencing. As C.S. Lewis once noted, if you find yourselves with a desire that nothing in the world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. There is a longing that only the Lord can fill in our lives. So in Psalm 42, what can we discover what are some of the ways to quench this deep spiritual thirst? Well, I think, first of all, the psalmist becomes really gut-level honest about his inner yearning, which requires that we, quote, pour out our soul. Now, what we discover in the Bible is that when you are in a spiritual desert, you sense that God is far away, how important it is that you continue to pray. 
You continue to seek God regardless of how you feel. I know in my own journey with the Lord, I experienced moments when I felt like I was talking to a wall or just whistling in the dark. I've experienced moments when I prayed and I prayed and I prayed for an issue to be resolved, and it got worse rather than better. I have been on my knees praying for healing for a friend, only to find myself peering into a casket. Yet, there have been other times when I have felt times of deep refreshment, where healing has occurred and where others have been restored to God. I think the one common denominator is that no matter the situation, I kept calling out to God, if you're angry and you're hurting, tell God that you're angry and you're hurting. You know, the Lord has broad shoulders. And as the psalm reminds us over and over and over again, spiritual dryness is made worse when you stop calling out to God. I think the second way that the psalm writer of 42 notes is in verse 5, is that he needs to hope in God. This is a theme that we find not only in verse 5, but also in verse 11, and then in Psalm 43, verse 5. Placing your, quote, hope in God requires that we draw on a memory of the Lord's great promises to God's people. I know that as a pastor, when people are grieving, when they're lonely, when they're scared, I think these eternal promises of Scripture are soothing. They're healing for this journey. When you recite God's great promises of hope, they begin to change your momentary feelings of despair. Finally, the psalmist reminds all of us who are thirsty to God to remember his steadfast love, a prayer to the God of my life, as it says in verse 8. Now, the writer of Psalm 42 has the story of God's faithfulness to his people by bringing them out of slavery in Egypt to remember, and to draw upon for strength. However, we followers of Jesus have even better resources than the psalmist. We can look to Jesus on the cross. Our Lord was abandoned. Our Lord was deserted. Our Lord was thirsty as his life ebbed away. And Jesus was steadfast in his desire to take the punishment for our sins. We're the ones who turned our backs on God. Yet it was Jesus' willingness to bear the marks of our rejection on his back that saved our souls. We've done wrong. Yet yet Jesus took the punishment. You know, this past summer, I had a brief moment of physical thirst as I searched for my quarters for a vending machine. Yet when I think of Jesus dying on the cross for me, I am reminded that he experienced a cosmic thirst where he longed to be connected to his heavenly father. Instead of having his thirst quenched, he felt so much absence that he cried out to God, why have you forsaken me? Friends, it was the willingness of Jesus to abandon his life for ours that enables us to eternally connect with our Lord. I think the satisfaction of our own spiritual thirst is remembering Jesus as parched, desperate, and lonely at the cross. As Charles Wesley, the great hymn writer, noted in the song Depth of Mercy, there for me a Savior stands, shows his wounds, spreads his hands. God is love. I know I feel. Jesus weeps but loves me still. You know, on the cross, Jesus shows us that only he can satisfy the deepest thirst of our souls. And on that cross, Jesus shows us that he can not only satisfy the deepest needs of our soul, Psalm 42 ends with that refrain, quote, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. 
the song ends with the writer still in a battle for spiritual thirst. But he is now uh, pointing his head and his heart towards victory, towards hope. He's not there yet, but he knows that the Lord is faithful. He knows that he will one day again praise God. Friends, we have that hope in the Lord. We have not been deserted, and our Lord is faithful. Preach this to yourself often and allow the living water to restore you, filling you with praise. Let's pray. Holy Lord, as we come to your table to eat of the feast you have prepared for us, help us to quench that deep spiritual thirst to know that we belong to you and that you fill us with an overwhelming mercy and grace. It's in our Savior's name we pray. Amen.